Today I want to talk about butterfly garden, specifically butterfly gardening in Florida. Um, I've noticed that the communities and parks I visit in Florida have some special challenges for butterflies, one of which here in Naples is that many people are in uh, condos and gated communities. So for those, those of you who have your own home and can do something besides put out a planter full of flowers, which is not a bad idea, let me just kind of review some things about butterfly gardening I think you should know for Florida. I'm going to start, as I often do, by this quotation from Doug Ptolemy. Our ignorance of nature is a cultural norm. I think this is especially true when it comes to insects. People have a number of stereotypes, among which I've listed a few here, that all insects sting, bite, eat our crops, spread diseases, are just plain icky. Well, I've noticed that if you put a dollar sign in front of numbers, people pay attention. So here are some numbers that I've found online that I think are interesting. Uh, the first one, that 75% of the crops around the world are pollinated by insects. And this was at one time estimated to $5,577 billion a year. And since these numbers are old, I'm sure the number is higher. In, in the United States, the, um, a study was done that calculated insects performing about $57 billion a year. And uh, same study found that the lowly little dung beetle, a relative of the Egyptian scarab beetle, uh, probably by breaking down manure and cattle lots and so on, uh, provides a service roughly of $580 million in 2024 dollars uh, a year. And what that break, yeah, what it breaks down to is last year, insects performed about $261 worth of services uh, for each person in the United States. So what conclusion can we reach? I think we should uh, reach that, first of all, we're learning that insects are declining, but despite the perception of insects as odious and so on, they're abundant, they're diverse, they provide eco-services that are crucial for life on Earth. I think the scientist E.O. Wilson of Harvard says it best when he said that insects are the little things that run the world. Well, butterflies may be the exception to the uh, stereotypes about insects. Butterflies are revered, actually, by many, many, many cultures. And I think um, that's one of the reasons people want to garden for them. Well, what is a butterfly? Well, butterflies belong with a group of insects called the Lepidoptera, scaled wings, along with the moths and another group of insects called skippers that are included usually with butterflies. And that's because the colors and patterns under their wings are the result of very tiny, tiny scales. All of these insects have a life cycle with very four distinct stages, start out as eggs, and their caterpillars or larva. There's the, they go through a pupa or chrysalis or cocoon stage. And from that emerges the adults. And all the adults have four wings, three body parts, six legs, and a straw-like mouth. Unlike moths, which have a feathery or club-like antenna, butterflies have a very, very slender one, as you can see on this photograph of a black swallowtail. Finally, butterflies do tend to be diurnal or day-loving, whereas moths are largely nocturnal. So why garden for butterflies? Well, now I'm going to have to bring up the idea of the insect apocalypse. Very briefly, this was something that started to receive publicity in 2017, when German scientists published a paper summarizing the results of a decades-long study that showed about a 75% decline in insect biomass at the study sites they had in Germany. Naturally, there's opposition, and critics, first of all, don't like the use of the word apocalypse. They think it's too, too, too uh, 
severe, it's too sensational. Uh, some critics say, well, the press likes, likes bad news, and so there's all this information uh, given to the apocalypse that's really not warranted. But most critics do concede that there has been a decline among terrestrial insects like butterflies, and that quite often, especially in North America and Europe, clear signs that insects are disappearing. And one of the insects happens to be the monarch butterfly. Uh, one of the ways that their population is gauged is that the eastern population spends the winter in mountains just a little bit west of Mexico City. This area was first uh, discovered as late as 1975. Well, in years 95, 96, the site covered 52 acres. That is, the butterflies, millions of butterflies were uh, spending the winter hanging in trees in that area. Last year, that same site was down to five and a half acres. And this year, that's even less than that, 2.2 acres. So you can see that based on what they find in the uh, wintering sites for the monarch butterflies, monarch butterflies are declining very drastically. Despite a lot of efforts people have uh, gone to to try to help them along. Well, if we want to help butterflies by gardening, we need to really better understand the butterfly life cycle. So we already talked about the four stages. I think it's important to note that after she mates, the female butterfly will lay her eggs on host plants. Now the host plant is very specific to each species of butterfly. It's what the larva will eat. No other kind of plant will do. I can't put a monarch caterpillar like the one in this photograph on a cabbage and expect it to live. And I probably couldn't put the larva of a cabbage white butterfly on a milkweed plant and expect it to live. Monarchs are very specific, but so is every single other species of butterfly and moth. We also have to understand that caterpillars are eating machines. They're, they're almost a separate kind of organism, ecologically speaking, from the adult butterfly. They spend their lives eating, building up fat. They retain that fat. They need it to become adults. I like to tell people this when they talk about having a butterfly garden. Flowers are fine. They're a punch bowl for the adults. But host plants are salad bars for caterpillars. They need host plants. So if you're planning a butterfly garden, you need to have both kinds of plants in your garden, on your property. Here's some basic considerations. First of all, I can't stress this enough, and I think Doug Ptolemy and a lot of other people would support me in saying this, you need to plant native plants. Most non-native ornamentals are not used by butterflies. I happen to spend the winter in Naples, Florida. I live in what many would consider a very beautiful community because of the uh, landscaping. But most of the plants I see are non-native ornamentals. Um, I, as recently as two days ago, I walked around in the middle of the afternoon. It was nice and warm looking at flowers. Besides not seeing butterflies, I didn't see any bees or any other pollinators. They're simply not visiting these plants. So plant as many native plants as you can. You try to you want to try to have a variety of nectar sources. So that means uh, at least three of each plant kind of plant you have and more would be better in mass plantings and have several varieties. You know, the flowers bloom at different times. The nectar is available at different times to the various uh, butterflies. And in fact, 
a, a point that should be made is that butterflies have what are called flight seasons. They, they appear at various times of the year. Some have one generation, some may have two, some may have more depending on where you are in the country and what the weather is like. <clears throat> Besides the nectar sources, you want to plant host plants. And at least three of each. For example, um, milkweeds come in several different species. So it's possible to plant uh, uh, two, three, maybe even four species of milkweeds having three different um, individual plants for each species, more if possible. And finally, and this is important, try to avoid using insecticides, pesticides, her herbicides, and even fertilizers. Uh, insecticides and pesticides should be fairly obvious. They're non-discriminatory in most cases. If it kills the insects you want to get rid of, it will kill the insects you want to keep. Herbicides and pet fertilizers might be a little bit more puzzling, but those chemicals go into the ground. They get sucked up by the, uh, by the plants. Yes, even the herbicides do, and uh, changes the, the composition. So those chemicals build up inside the caterpillars and eventually into the uh, adult butterfly. It may kill them, the caterpillars, uh, fairly quickly, may be a slow lingering process, may mean that they don't complete their metamorphosis, may mean that they're uh, misshapened when they come out of their cocoons, they're crystalless. Uh, just try to avoid those as much as possible. I don't know if many big box stores or places where we commonly buy plants for our gardens are much help in finding native plants that are suitable. So four sources that I've looked at and I use are, first of all, the National Wildlife Federation has, has a whole separate site called Garden for Wildlife. And you can go there, uh, let them know where you live, uh, suitable plants are suggested. And what's interesting about this uh, site is that it will connect you to people and companies that will sell you plants that have passed the Wildlife Federation's guidelines for being safe to use, being appropriate, and what have you. The Audubon Society at audubon.org backslash native plants is a really nice feature. You can put in your zip code and you will get a list, quite a long list, you, actually, of plants that are good for your zip code. Um, you can even tweak it a little bit. You could uh, say, I want ones for birds, I want, or maybe I want what kind of trees, what kind of flowers, and so on. The Xerxes Society is the largest invertebrate conservation organization in the country, probably in the world. And at their homepage, Xerxes.org, they offer tips and suggestions for gardening for butterflies. Finally, the North American Butterfly Association at NABA, N-A-B-A dot org, also offers suggestions and help. So these, these are four very good sources. You might go online and find out that you actually have a native plant society in your community or in your area that might not only offer suggestions, but a, be able to supply you with suitable plants. Like I said, this pr pr particular presentation is focused on Florida. So uh, these are the suggestions that the Audubon uh, app suggested for Naples, Florida, the American beautyberry, butterfly weed, clustered bush mint, a type of holly, dahoon, type of goldenrod, seaside goldenrod, and a type of bee balm, spotted bee balm. I know I have uh, bee balm species in my garden in the Chicago area, and it is very popular, not only with butterflies and other pollinating insects, but it's a real magnet for hummingbirds during the summer and early fall. 
And these are what some of these plants look like. The beauty berry, the butterfly weed, the hoon holly, and gold, the goldenrod. So these are suggestions. There's a lot more options though. And if you visit any of those four sites, you can see what those options are. Well, I'm going to talk a little bit now about specific butterflies, and I want to talk about the milkweed butterflies. Throughout most of the country, certainly where I am in Chicago, the monarch butterfly, the one on the right, is the common milkweed butterfly. But here in Florida, there's actually three. The monarch is one, and then another one called the queen, which is over in the left-hand side. And there's a third one called the soldier, which looks rather like a queen. There's differences, slight differences in veining. You really need, almost need to have the butterfly in hand to uh, distinguish between the two. But all three species depend on milkweeds for um, the host plant for their caterpillars. What I discovered here in Naples, though, is a lot of what's called tropical or scarlet milkweed, the one on the right. It's not appropriate, it's bad. For one thing, it's non-native and it's invasive. If it gets out of the garden, it begins replacing a variety of native milkweed species. For another reason, although the monarch caterpillars seem to love this plant, it contains a protozoa parasite that can eventually either kill the, the caterpillar, cause it not to go through metamorphosis, or cause the adults to be deformed. Finally, there's evidence that in the more northern areas of where this milkweed is used, it causes the butterflies not to migrate. And instead of going to Mexico like they should, they die. The butterfly milkweed, the one on the left, is a good milkweed, and it's uh, very popular with all kinds of insects. If you look carefully at the photograph uh, on the right, lower right, you might see a couple of honeybees on these flowers. The reason I've chosen these two is that they're the two species that are most often commercially available. Milkweed is not difficult to grow from seed if you need to go out and uh, make sure you're getting an appropriate local species. But these two are the two that you might find. I would advise you not to get the scarlet or tropical milkweed. There are people who are big fans of it, but the Xerxes Society and most other groups concerned with insect conservation strongly advise against it. There is the passion flower butterflies. There are a whole group of butterflies that feed on passion flowers, passion vines. And the two that I see most commonly here in the Naples area are the Gulf fritillary on the left and the zebra longwing on the right. Uh, the Gulf fritillary many more times than the zebra longwing. But I generally manage, if I see butterflies flying around, I'll see one or two zebra longwings at a site. Here's a picture of the fritillary's caterpillar. It's orange with those black spines. Those spines are important. They're irritating. It's a warning to predators. Stay away from me. Like monarchs and queens who eat milkweed, the fritillaries and the longwings, by eating the passion flower, build up toxins in their body that make them distasteful, even fatal for a predator to eat. I'm calling these two the Cassia cuties. Um, they're sulfurs. Both of them are yellow. Both of them are fairly large if you're used to the sulfurs in the Northeast or the Midwest. The orange barred sulfur is a little more intense in color than the cloudless. The orange bars aren't apparent in this float photograph. Part of the reason is they're on the top side of the wings and most sulfurs, most of the time, will land on a flower and fold their wings. So a really good identification mark is not apparent on, in the resting butterfly.
I'm going to call this one a deal delight. It's a black swallowtail. And there's the larva on the uh, right hand side feeding on parsley. I grow parsley up in Illinois for the express purpose of having black swallowtails lay their eggs on it. And they usually do. What's interesting about the black swallowtail is that its relatives, and there's quite a few here in Florida, there's nine species of swallowtails. Several of them uh, feed on host plants that render them toxic, just like a monarch butterfly. And so the black swallowtail, which is not really toxic, imitates them, mimics them. This kind of mimicry where um, harmless species mim mimics uh, a dangerous, potentially dangerous species is called uh, Bait Batesian mimicry. And this is a good example. I would certainly uh, grow d dill, parsley, fennel, carrots, if I wanted to attract and raise some black swallowtails. <clears throat> There's so many uh, depressing stories sometimes in conservation. I'm gonna share a success story. Uh, it's the Adela, a small butterfly found here in Florida. At one time, it was thought extinct. It was discovered as host plant is a native species called Kunti, uh, kind of a coarse plant, but a very, very hardy plant. The uh, indigenous people in Florida actually found a way to take the root of the Kunti, uh, remove the toxins and make a, a bread out of it. So here you, what happened though, is that people started planting Kunti. The more Kunti they planted, suddenly, the Atala showed up. And so at a couple times of the year, they can be found. I am very happy to say that I've seen lots of Kunti plantings, even in meridian strips here in the Naples area. I haven't located the Atala as I hoped to, but I suspect it has more to do with when I'm in Florida than the actual um, presence of the species of butterfly. It's a small black butterfly and it's, uh, like I said, it's very, very helpful that it's been brought back from what was thought to be the state of extinction. And finally, there's the white peacock. It's possibly Naples' most common butterfly. I, I see it, if I see a butterfly, I'm gonna see this one. It feeds, larva feeds on a water plant called hyssop, but uh, the butterfly itself feeds on a variety of flowers. Here it's on what amounts to a lawn weed, uh, I guess, if you're trying to grow a grass lawn called large flowered Mexican clover, uh, a plant that's favorite of a lot of kinds of insects. But, um, you know, it's a good one, I think, if, you put out flowers here in Naples for the purpose of attracting butterflies. Sooner rather than later, you're going to see white peacocks. Well, these butterflies are only the beginning. Uh, here's some numbers. Florida has 180 reported butterfly species. 77 have been reported from Collier County, where Naples is. And in addition, there's 2,000 moth species from Florida and 562 from Collier County alone. And when you start looking at moths, that's a whole other uh, area to explore. You know, the, you know that moths are not necessarily nocturnal. Many uh, come out early in the morning or late in the afternoon, and some are diurnal. Here's three uh, small moths that I think are very colorful that are diurnal probably overlooked uh, any one of them would barely cover a thumbnail if that so you have the stained glass moth on the left above it is the orange spotted flower moth and below it the ornate pella moth and i just recently made the acquaintance of another moth i'm one it's wondering if it's uh mimicking the Atala butterfly. Uh, I forgot to mention that Kunti 
is very, can be very toxic. And so predators avoid both the caterpillar and the butterfly. Well, the white spotted black moth is a day flying moth. And you can see it has a sort of resemblance to the Atala. The first ones I saw before they landed and I got a close up look, I thought perhaps were Atalas. Well, I'm gonna conclude now. I wanna thank you for uh, listening and watching this and thank you for caring about the environment. So uh, if you have any questions, I'll try to answer them. Those four websites are good sources. They're a good place to begin. Good night.